follow that. And perfect. All right. And go ahead and say who you are and what you do. Hello. My name is Aaron Marcus. I'm principal of Aaron Marcus and Associates in Berkeley, California. And what was your first computer use? My first computer use was in 1965 through 66. <clears throat> or, yes, or maybe 66 through 67, when I learned programming in Fortran in Yale's Computer Center, where I was a graduate student in the graphic design department of Yale Art School. I had studied physics for four years prior to that, but I had never used computers. They were too <clears throat> new. Instead, I had helped to plot data points on graph paper, on chart paper. I was the computer creating numerical or data graphics for faculty members at Princeton. And what was the first time you actually saw the computer itself? Well, <clears throat> the first time I saw computers was certainly when I was programming uh, job decks of cards, polygraph cards, in 66. But the most powerful experience that I had being with computers was sometime in my summer internship at Dell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey. I was taken on as a intern for the summer, a research intern. In fact, the job came about in a very funny way that I was encouraged to apply for the position by one of my classmates at Yale who said, come on, Aaron, you know about computers and programming. Certainly, you'll have success with those interviewers. I wasn't so sure. I came into the interview room, and there were two Bell Labs engineers in dark blue suits, white shirts, narrow ties. It was straight out of men in black, only they weren't wearing sunglasses. And they didn't have the neuralizer or whatever it was called to blank out the <laughs> memory of the interview. So I came into the room and said, what you should never say in a job interview. I have no idea why you would hire me. But I did study physics and math and philosophy for four years, and now I'm in art school learning graphic design, typography, color, visual communication. Can you do anything with that? And the two men <coughs> looked at me, turned to each other, smiled a little smile, turned back to me, and one of them said, well, actually, we're looking for someone exactly like you. That was the start of my summer work at Bell Labs and my career in computer art, computer graphics, later user interface design. In fact, one of the people in that room was Michael Noble, my mentor at Bell Labs, along with Peter Danish, who was a passenger. At Bell Labs, I went into the main control room. I could easily have access to everything. And so sometime in June or July 1967, I entered into the room where the IBM, not IBM 360, the GE 635, I believe, was held, captured, contained. And suddenly, I was surrounded only by central processing units. I could feel the hum through the floor, through my body. I could hear the fan. I saw the lights blinking, and I thought, this is really weird. I am inside of a computer, sort of, and <clears throat> this is the future of humankind. To be working and to be united with these digital creations of our brains. For me, it was a religious moment. It was quite uh, spiritual, quite powerful. That was the first major experience of being inside of a computer, so to speak. I had a similar feeling when I once sat, maybe 10 years later, or 15 years later, or more, 
inside of a Cray computer, a Cray supercomputer, which is sort of a large cylindrical container of processing units with a hollowed out cylindrical space. And I sat down and I parked my behind right inside of the machine, uh, surrounded, except for the narrow opening, by computer technology. So those were at least two significant experiences of being a seeing computers, being with computers, and in fact, being surrounded by computers. Well, I'm going to ask you about a couple of words. We're going to start with this one. And is this called Weather Report? Yes, this is a weather report series that I worked on in 1972. <clears throat> this is a very typographical work, and it was a kind of visible language experiment that was created by programming a PDP-10 computer, I believe, controlling a photo typesetting machine at Yale's computer center where I was working, where I was being on sabbatical from Princeton to Yale, going back to Yale to play with computers, to experiment, to find out what could be done. At that time, it was fairly novel for a photo typesetting machine to be attached to a computer. This was a linotype typesetter, I can't remember the actual designation. <clears throat> and this was very much influenced by a particular creation of something like a weather report by Dan, Daniel Friedman, uh, my friend and colleague who passed away many years ago and is quite famous in the graphic design world. And what I tried to create was a way to display the headlines of the New York Times for a particular day. In fact, it's January 26, 1972. Those are the headlines from the front page of the New York Times. <clears throat> that text was fed into the computer according to the program that it wrote. The, the text sections were distributed around the area of display, and what you got was a kind of poem, a poem drawing that depicted not only the physical weather of the day, if that's in fact here, it was Wednesday, January 26, 1972. But there are names in the news, there are events in the news. This is the political weather, the economic weather, the social weather of the world at that time as viewed by the New York Times. <clears throat> and I was intrigued by the idea that you could create a poem drawing, a visual display of typography that could in fact be fed straight from the news headlines and the ASCII character strings that were powering the production of uh, informational news at the time. So this is only one of several, I believe, that I set up and programmed at the time. In fact, at one point with this photo typesetting machine, I took out the photographic plate that had images of all the particular characters. I inserted instead a piece of glass that I had covered with uh, candle soup to make it black and then scratched away randomly on its surface, sort of chicken scratches, and sent a text. The text did not know that it was not, the computer didn't know that it was setting chicken scratches or kind of little drawing symbols, random markings and out came a kind of graphical uh, expression which was completely different from this kind of expression with mechanical, carefully thought, carefully designed topography. And I was interested in what ways I could use and transform regular news and regular expression of comments, of thoughts, into something that was completely different in category 
very visual and nonverbal. Can I give you your next point? Which is this one, which I don't know. I literally know nothing about this piece at all. Put your hands up. This piece is one of several computer artworks that I produced in the summer of 1967 and onward during 1969 through 71 when I was a consultant at Bell Labs in Murrayville, New Jersey. During 69 through 71, I was programming, creating a program to to develop a prototype page design layout system for the picture phone. That was intended to assist all of the yellow pages in laying out all of the telephone yellow pages of America uh, more efficiently, effectively, lower cost, etc. And to do that using the picture phone, which had just been showcased in 1964 at the World Fair, if I remember, in New York City. At that time, I was using, I think, a stronger Carlson 4020 display device, probably powered by either the GE 635 mainframe or possibly a PDP 10 <clears throat> to explore how could randomness be combined with very precise uh, pre-programmed display of line elements, of solid elements, other drawing elements, to create something which had a more human touch, a human feel, but was in fact strictly based in computer graphics programming and was uh, in effect predetermined uh, by <coughs> random number generator in the program that I had created to take use of that, to make use of that. These images <coughs> were of interest to me because they seem to have a, a kind of hieroglyphic or erratic uh, symbolism quality to them. I explored that in many other of my computer graphics artworks at the time in 19... 67 through probably through 1990-1992. And some of these works are actually cataloged in one of the monographs that I published uh, called Software Incorporated Volume 1 that contained computer artworks, visible language experiments, and conceptual artworks that have to do with typography and symbol making. And more of the conceptual artworks are documented in the second volume called Software Incorporated 2. <clears throat> so I've been interested in my mark making and symbol making uh, since early childhood, actually. <clears throat> and the fact that I learned Hebrew, that I learned Latin, and as well as English, and Fortran. Uh, it meant that I was interested in language and symbol sets and even the alphabet and the history of our alphabet. I remember as a child being fascinated by a table that showed the development of our own alphabet over several uh, millennia, actually. <coughs> and that letters turned around and assumed different shapes and had begun with pictographic representation of objects in many cases, snakes, other animals, four-footed animals, like the letter A, which now looks like this, but was originally like this, representing an ox head. You can see the little ox head and the two horns wiggling. And that was Aleph in Hebrew, which means ox. And these letter forms twisted around through history and assumed many shapes and forms. You may not sense it here, but that's part of the historical background <coughs> to 
my interest in uh, simple geometric forms and the uh, minimalist kind of marks. I was also influenced as well by Michael Knowles uh, interest in uh, random number generator use in recreating the works of Mondrian or Mondrian light artworks <coughs> and imagery that was programmed through his uh, particular uh, interest in programs for computers at the time. Okay. Now one of my favorite pieces. Sometimes some planted forests, 
you would have this flickering in and out experience of the order of rows and, and elements aligning carefully. And other times it would be quite random. In addition, in this space was a little person. An artificial creature was dancing around, moving around somewhat randomly. You might not see that person on a first visit. You might have to come back and visit again. In addition, I don't know if it's here. I don't think so. I think it's off to the left, out of sight. It was a revolving uh, sculpture of letter forms rotating in space. So I had sculptural elements made out of dynamic elements made out of type, uh, visual elements, very simple and abstract, as well as a little human character moving around the landscape. That human character was inspired also from one of Michael Knowles' early experiments in creating a dancer that could move its body according to that notation, which is dance notation, that would be fed into the computer by either experts in dance or lab notation. So parts of this sprang from my contact with other people at Bell Labs. There were many, many artists who would come to their uh, Namjoon Pike, a video artist, filmmakers, Frida Nake, all kinds of people who were in the pioneering world of computer art and computer graphics at the time. This particular display is are the only remnants of this artwork because it existed in my code, <coughs> rather simple code, and uh, the displays that were shown on the screen, which I put Polaroid photos on. Recently, I've had an exhibit of this work at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. There are people at the Museum for Art and uh, Digital Entertainment in Oakland, California, who are trying to recreate this artwork with modern computers because it's rather simple, it can be easily done. And it would be a very surprising and unexpected thing to see this artwork come into being again after 40 years of non-existence. That remains to be seen. At Bell Labs, did you ever encounter uh, Ed Enschroer? Oh, oh. Uh, <coughs> one of my dad's friends. For Ed Enschroer, I knew as a child because he illustrated many IF magazine and Galaxy science fiction uh, pulp magazines, which, some of which I think I still have in my collection. And he was one of my heroes. Uh, I was drawing rocket ships, ray guns, satellites, visions of other planets, in part based on those images. And I still have that complete collection of my sci-fi drawings from the age of 10, 9, 10, or 11 years ago. So it was a remarkable experience to meet him, uh, who so influenced my emotions as a child and to encounter him now that I was more or less grown up, uh, to meet the person who had accomplished that emotional influence. A friend of my dad and so many of my interests in his seem to overlap, and there's a great uh, biography and bibliography of his work. Well, uh, my interest in science fiction has carried onwards uh, to occasional readings. I, I just recently read um, an Asimov book about robots, which I appreciated so much realizing how impression he was in understanding ro robot and AI issues that we're encountering now, some 40 or 50 years later, he had already talked about these things in his book. In addition, I have organized a, an e-book based on my lecture and tutorial called um, The Past 100 Years of the Future user experience in HCI design in science fiction movies and television. And I have gathered together scenes from many, many science fiction movies, 
uh, for the past century, really more than a century, back to its origins in France in the late 19th century, uh, to comment on how people uh, guess correctly or incorrectly about the directions of technology, about uh, social issues, about all kinds of other user experience. And human-centered design, human computer interface design issues that are quite relevant now and were sometimes envisioned decades before we encountered them. Certainly in, in Metropolis, they have uh, wall screen television sets in 1927 or 8, which were about 20 years ahead of the actual uh, production abilities of, of television. That was the artsy industrial long shot. <laughs> What's this piece? This piece from 1972-74 is called Evolving Gravity. It too is a typographic work using Yale Computer Center's PDP 8 or 10, I think, uh, powering the photo linotype photo typesetting machine. I was uh, using only a limited set of signs and symbols and trying to produce a graphic visual impact with typeset characters. Um, this was done originally in black and white, and then the Pratt Graphic Center in uh, New York City commissioned me to do two computer graphic serifs of uh, large scale in color which I was very pleased to have the commission to do. <coughs> I think they did it as a membership uh, incentive. So this was one of them. I, I produced these as lithographs also because they were printed in an annual report of a bank in Norfolk, Virginia. I would take whatever commission I could get <laughs> to see them realized in color. And then uh, the Pratt Graphic Center came along and I was able to produce the large-scale version of Devolving Gravity as well as Noise Barrier, which was the, the work I mentioned earlier using chicken scratches on the photographic plate to set something similar but with a completely different visual feel of a kind of calligraphic or hand-drawn nature. And these, these works were some continuation of the, of the typographic and symbol making experiments which I have cataloged in, in these two monographs and which occupied my time. But it's also somewhat related to my continuing interest in human computer interaction and communication through typography and other uh, mark making that has, in fact, powered my work for the past 35 years as the principal designer analyst of Aaron Marcus and Associates. And there we've worked on commercial systems that have led to projects like uh, mobile persuasion design projects to find out how human behavior could be influenced and changed by whatever we're producing in the form of mobile applications. <clears throat> and another book that was just released last November together with this and three other proceedings uh, books is uh, HCI and User Experience Design, which I've just learned is going to be translated into Chinese. And uh, the, the downloads for these chapters of this book in particular are quite high surprisingly high, I think, for me and for the publisher, which I'm happy to, to acknowledge. And thanks, Springer. So <clears throat> the fact that the, the works that you happen to have assembled here today all deal with uh, verbal components, typography elements, 
make them very different than figurative work, uh, drawings of people, drawings of landscapes. <clears throat> there are landscapes, but they are abstract, platonic kind of lands landscapes of ideal forms. Or <clears throat> they are typographic and involve word, a few words or many words or typographic symbols, but <clears throat> uh, in fact they are uh, poetic in nature, expressing attitudes or feelings about the world, about technology, about human experience. And that is perfect. That was exactly what I was hoping we would do. You want to take one snapshot here? Absolutely. Oh, this is going to be a